again, guys. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about that phrase, how will be your name? What does that mean? I think the holiness of God is one of the most uncomfortable attributes of God. It's, parts of, it's the parts of the Bible that don't make sense to us. Um, and I want to look at that. Um, just to give you an example of what I mean, you think of uh, Peter in the boat. When Jesus comes up to Peter and he says, cast your nets down. When he finally does, and it's full of fish, Peter says, depart from me. And he falls at his feet. Why would he have that response? Why? You know, we think of Jesus as loving, we can get that. We think of God as our Father that forgives us, we can understand that. But when it comes to the holiness of God, it's, it's very difficult to understand it. Um, and I want to go through a text that's kind of long, but it's a very interesting story. And there's a couple parts of it where the holiness of God sticks out in a very uncomfortable way. And I want to do my best to unpack that tonight. Um, we're looking, if you have the Bibles, in 2 Samuel 6. We're going to do the whole chapter. I'm going to read through it. Um, David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 of all. He and all his men set out from Baal of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ohio was walking in front of them. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs, harps, lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacom, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God, because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of God, the ark of the Lord, to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything that he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the temple that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites. Both men and women and all the people went to their homes. And David returned home to bless his household. Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, Who was before the Lord, who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house, when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people? I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Some uncomfortable things in this story. I want to talk to you about the need for the ark, the problem of the ark, the gospel according to the ark, and the joy of the ark. I'm going to do my best to do that in 10 minutes. Um, so this starts out, David gathers 30,000 men. He doesn't do this because he's afraid of an attack. Um, by the way, I'm also getting some information. There's a parallel account in 1 Chronicles 13 and 15. 
So if you don't see information in this text that it seems like I'm reciting, um, it's, it's probably taken from there. Um, so he gathers 30,000 men. It's not because he's afraid of attack. He's going because he wants us to be impressive. He needs this ark. He wants this ark. Um, some of you guys are like me. You grew up in the church. Um, I, I would imagine not everyone here did. So I want to give you a little bit of background on what, what the ark is. Uh, the ark represented God dwelling with the people. Um, in when the Israelites were God's chosen people, when they're crossing, when they're entering into Canaan, there's this river that's in the way of the Jordan River. God tells them, take the ark into the river, and the river lets them through. When there's a, a city in the way, uh, Jericho, they tell them to take the ark around the city seven days and the walls fall down. Right, this is a powerful ark. When Eli's sons uh, take the ark to battle, and they lose the battle, the ark is taken. And this ark, like, this is a, this is a very interesting story for another day, but it's taken by the Philistines, which are the, the enemies of the Israelites. And they put it in their temple, and the ark of God decapitates their idol of God. And it gives everyone in the town tumors, like they, they are, the Greeks have it on these people. And they get rid of it because they're terrified of it. Because it represents God dwelling with the people, and God is a holy God. So, actually, Saul, who was the king before David, um, and not, not a very uh, a good king, he didn't walk with the Lord like David did. It's actually a good representation of his relationship. The whole time he was king, the ark was actually not in the capital. It was way out in the outskirts of Israel the whole time. So now David is king, and he wants to bring this ark. He wants to show people... I'm not your king, it's really God that's king. And to really illustrate this, like any good leader knows, you have to live the kind of life that you want other people to do. You can't live one life and just kind of bark orders. So in order to show the people that God is king, David wants this ark brought up to the city of David. So he goes, he wants, he wants the ark, he needs the ark. He has this yearning for a relationship with God. And you see this, this is, this is not something that's yesteryear. You see this in any culture. People yearn for a relationship with God. People search for it in different ways. It may not be Christianity. There's other religions. But if you look back through time and history, cultures always yearn to close this gap. So there's always this need at our hearts that we know we ignore, but there's this need for a reconciliation with God, for fellowship with Him. And David needs it as well. But the problem with the ark, you see, when, when they're bringing the ark, Uzzah seems like he has good intentions. They're bringing the ark. The ark is going to fall. He's just trying to stop it. He puts his hand out, and God strikes him dead. Why would he do that? What kind of God is this? This is why people don't like Christianity, by the way. They look at this and say, what is this? I don't want a God like this. This God, he, there's this new movement. It's, it's not really new, but the new atheism. This is so, this is pervading colleges, people, and high school students. Now it's a huge problem. There's something like 40 to 50 percent of high school students that grow up in the church. They go to college and they, they leave their faith because you have stuff like this. And we don't have answers to this. Um, I think there is answers. But when you look at this, it's face value. It's like, I, I don't want to serve a God like that. How can God? I thought the Bible says that God looks at the heart. As a heavy intentions, why do you strike him down? Uh, let me... In Leviticus, when, when it's talking about the ark, when they're building the ark, God gives very specific instructions. If you read the Old Testament, there's a ton of sort of like weird rules that he asks the Israelites to follow. And I think a lot of times we get caught up looking you know, at the, the trees instead of seeing the, the whole forest. Um, but when, when they're talking about the ark specifically, uh, if you're going to move the ark, you, there's these loops inside, and you have to put this golden pole through it. And you have to carry the ark on your shoulders. So not anybody can carry it. Only Levites can carry it. And even then, the Levites, they have to go through these ceremonial cleansing things before they can even do it. So there's this ton of preparation involved. And it has to be a certain person. And it has to be a certain way. And then what did David do? I mean, he did, they threw it on a cart that's far pulled by an ox. This is not at all the way it's supposed to be done. So we look at us and we say, he broke one rule. What's the big deal? Well, you see all these rules that he broke. It's not just one rule he broke. He's God. It's not a, a terrible God. He's not like a cranky God. That's, that's the, the, the you, when you see these other religions, it's 
God is this cranky deity, and we have to do certain things to appease him. And this is the way, actually, uh, that, that David ends up approaching it. Um, I'll talk about that next. Um, so Uzzah reaches out, touches this ark. Um, the whole point, I think, of all of the Old Testament rules, um, God is, since he is the creator, he's the ultimate communicator. Um, and you guys maybe aren't uh, as slow as me, but I don't catch on to things too quick. I kind of need visual aids. Like, you can tell me things, you can tell me directions, but show me a map. Or you can tell me how to do, how to work a machine, but just show me, right? And that's, that's what this is. This is God's teaching by showing you. Uh, you know, nobody really knows that they're a sinner until God shows you that you're a sinner. We, we don't learn a lot of things unless God shows it to us. So these rules, the whole point of all of the rules in the Old Testament, I believe, is to say, you are a sinner, cannot come into my presence unless there's some sort of, some things need to happen. We are, we are wholly different, you and I. Um, so Uzzah, when he reaches out and touches this ark, God's holiness, it's, it's, like, it's like fire and water. Whenever these sin and holiness touch, one has to consume the other, and it's always holiness. It's always God that consumes the other. It's like a brick wall. The holiness of God is like a brick wall. The wall is not unjust. The wall is not cranky. If you run your car into the wall, you're going to get smashed. Because what the, call, the wall is the wall. It's just being itself. God is holy. And when sin touches holiness, it gets consumed. And it's not that God is cranky. It's, it's who he is. So the, the, the problem of the ark, the need of the ark is we need... We need this relationship with God. The problem with the ark is that he's holy. We, we can't just enter into his presence. Now the gospel, according to the ark, David approaches it with this procession, sort of like a parade against 30,000 men. They're dancing, they're singing. This is, this is like trying to come to God and saying, like, look at my good works. Look at what I've done. I've given away my car to my brother. I've done all of these great things, God, now, you know, it's good enough, right? God is saying, your sin is much more serious than you think it is. And a lot of times the ways that he has to show us this is through some sort of real life catastrophe, like with us. Can you imagine this? This is like a party, they're dancing, and then all of a sudden somebody drops dead. The party dies. I mean, that, that's it. Can you imagine that? That's terrifying. And David says, you know, what are we going to do with this? So they, they kind of freak out and just drop it at some guy's backyard, which is terrifying. I mean, this is no gift. This thing just killed somebody, and they leave it in Obed-Edom's backyard, and just, you know, he, David runs, and then, so this is the line. The gospel, according to the yard, this is where you, you see that David begins to get this. He sees how terrifyingly holy God is, and he says, how can this ark come to me? How can God ever have a relationship with me? And it says that David was angry. Um, a lot of the commentators agree on this. David wasn't angry at us. David wasn't angry at God. David was angry at himself. He should have, he should have known this. And here, Uzzah is paying the consequence. And he's angry and, and despairing because how can I ever approach this holy God? So, what I want you to see, though, it doesn't stop there. The gospel isn't just that you're terrible, I'm terrible, there, there's more to it. So the, the terrifying, scary art that everyone just leaves behind at Obed-Edom, God makes sure that Obed-Edom is blessed because it is there. Amen. And he makes sure that David hears about it. So David hears this, and then he gets it. He begins to get it. And the New Testament says that the prophets of old see what we know now through, through a glass dimly. And I think David finally begins to get this. He's, he's, he's realized this isn't something that God can just shrug away. I, I need to do this right. So he goes back to the book. It says uh, in Chronicles that he gets the Levites. He goes through all the ceremonies. He comes back to the ark. There's rejoicing. He gets the Levites to do it the proper way. But it's not just that he's doing things right, because that would not be the gospel. That would be just like every other religion. Just do things right. Um, before the Israelites move six steps, 
The number seven for Jews is, is a very, it signifies completion. So saying that they, when they walked six steps, it's like before they went anywhere, this is sort of like the, the saying, before they went anywhere, David sacrifices. And, and uh, you, you can read this in Leviticus, the sacrifice, what you would do with the sacrifice is you would put your hand on it, and then you would slay it and utterly burn it. And what it meant was, you would do this when you were going to enter the temple, or what you're saying really is, in order for me to enter God's presence, if I were to enter God's presence, this is what would happen to me. I would be destroyed. And David, through a glass of dimly, sees that the only way that I can enter God's presence is if somebody is utterly destroyed for me. So he doesn't know, he doesn't know Jesus, but he knows through a glass dimly that somebody has to be sacrificed in order for me to get in a relationship with God. And I want to read you this, that is fulfilled. We do know it. We don't have the glass dimly. I'm going to do my best to open my Bible here with one hand. I'm just going to put it on my The writer of Hebrews says it like this. This is Hebrews 10. Because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. I have come to do your will, O God. And then in verse 10 it says, And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Thank you. And then you see the last point, the joy of the ark. David is dancing before the ark on the way back. He's not dancing to earn God's favor. He's dancing because he knows he already has it. He's dancing because he's realized, I can never enter the presence of God. And it's only by the sacrifice of another. It's only by grace that I can enter it. And he has this relationship. And he's bringing it back to the city of David. And then you see Michael. His wife, Saul's daughter, despises this. She sees like a king. Imagine like, you know, Obama that's dancing like ridiculously, not at all like a president should be dancing, and not with people that a president should be dancing. This, this is David, right? He is dancing with the servant girls. And he, you know, unrobes, he takes off his fancy things, and he's, he's having a good time. And his wife sees him and says, you're being ridiculous, you're making a fool of yourself, you are the king, and these people are not going to respect you. And see, the thing, the difference between religion and Christianity, when you are all about religion, if you're doing great, you are proud. But when you're not doing good, you despair. When you're, when you're doing good, when you're having a good day, you feel really good about yourself. If you're having a bad day, you feel terrible about yourself. But when you get the gospel, it's not that you think less of yourself when you when you fail. It's you, you just think of yourself less. It's not about you. It's about God. It's not about your performance. God accepts you not based on your performance. And we praise him for that. It's on the performance of Jesus. Glory to God. That's the difference between religion and the God of grace. The God of grace is holy and we worship him because he is holy. And we worship him because he's a God that's set apart from any other religion. There's no other religion like this. Other religions tell you, you have to do this, you have to do this, and then finally you can enter the gateway of heaven. Christianity starts off saying, you can, you can never do this. Even God, now this, this is in Romans 3, this is going to sound blasphemous, but it's not. Even God could not close this gap. God could not just say, well, you know, I, I forgive you. He had to sacrifice his son to close this gap. It's no small matter. In the end, it says, Michael had no children to the she died. And this is, you know, we, can, we see again, this is this Old Testament, like this Bible is crazy. But when you think about this, this is grace all over again. Michael didn't have David's children, but Jesus is from the line of David. So, so who did have the seed, the messianic seed? Who was it passed through? It wasn't passed through the royal Michael who grew up in the courts of Saul. It was passed through an adulteress, a common person, Bathsheba. This is who the Messiah came through. God uses broken people who realize their sin 
There is nothing to keep, there's no failure that will keep you from God. It's only when you refuse to admit that you are a failure that will keep you from the real, true, living God. Glory to God. Thank you.